Welcome back. Joining us now here on News Talk, Congressman John Delaney, a Democrat. He represents Maryland's 6th District. Congressman, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you very much for your time. Nice to talk to you, Bruce. By the way, I, I meant to pass along uh, before introducing you uh, a little bit of breaking news. Uh, a jury has been seated in the trial of Officer uh, William Porter in Baltimore. It took about two and a half days. We figured it would take two to three days. A jury in Baltimore, in the case of the first of six officers uh, who will stand trial on the death of Freddie Gray, has been seated. The trial can now begin. That's some breaking news that we can pass along to you. Congressman Delaney, uh, great having you here. Thank you so much for your time. There is, a, of course, a lot going on. Can we begin by talking about the transportation bill? Sure. Where does it stand? How much money is uh, is Congress, is Washington going to allocate to uh, start uh, in this overdue manner to fix our crumbling roads and bridges? Well, w too little is the short answer, Bruce. If you look at the scale of the problem we have with infrastructure in this country, our roads, our bridges, uh, ports, energy, communications infrastructure, the whole portfolio of infrastructure has been massively underinvested in. It's hurting our citizens. It's diminishing economic growth in this country. It's hurting the competitiveness of our largest uh, companies. The House of Representatives, we approved. I didn't vote for it. I was one of the few people not to support it. The House of Representatives approved a bill that keeps funding at current levels. In other words, they look at the facts, they look at this underinvestment we've had in our infrastructure, and they've decided that kind of baseline or flatline levels of infrastructure funding is what we should be doing. I think that's a terrible outcome. That's what we've done in the House. The Senate has, has uh, proposed a bill that's slightly higher, but it's still way below what most objective experts believe we need to do. And so now we're in this reconciliation process. There's a bill coming tomorrow that is kind of a compromise between the two bills. In my opinion, it's still uh, woefully inadequate. It, it very, very modestly increases our funding uh, in infrastructure. And on an inflation-adjusted basis, it doesn't. But so, that's where we are now. So given that uh, we've underinvested in this area for yes. a long time, we've got roads and bridges that are in terrible shape. The uh, Arlington Memorial Bridge, which is a, you know, a, right. a stone's throw and a half from where you are now, from yes. where you and your colleagues work, it's down to four lanes. We don't have right. all six lanes because the thing is crumbling. Right. This money creates jobs. It is an economic uh, booster of a, of a very, uh, to a very significant extent. Why not meet the problem with the solution that is commensurate? What is the deal? So the problem is, I, I think people agree with those facts that you just laid out, Bruce. I think people understand, not as, as thorough as they, as they should, but infrastructure is a really good investment, as you said. The problem has been how to pay for this increase in infrastructure investment, right? We've paid for it historically with the gas tax, which we haven't raised in over 20 years. So as a result, the amount of money that comes into the infrastructure fund from the gas tax is only about 60 or 65 percent of the amount of money that gets paid out. So figuring out ways to fund that gap has been the question. Many people have proposed increasing the gas tax. I've proposed and have built huge bipartisan support for fixing our broken international tax system mm -hmm. where two trillion dollars of corporate cash sits overseas, which by the way is a problem that is hurting us almost as much as this infrastructure crisis as it relates to diminished economic growth. We proposed fixing that, getting that money back, which would generate additional tax revenues, and allocating those tax revenues towards this gap between the gas tax and the amount of money we need to spend on infrastructure. Under our proposal, we could not only increase the traditional sources of funding for infrastructure, which is the Highway Trust Fund, but we could also create a whole new national infrastructure fund that over time could fund about a trillion dollars of additional projects. So our solution matches up well with the problem that you've identified, which, by the way, that problem is also a huge opportunity. To, what do you make of companies that move their assets uh, to other nations to avoid American taxation, even as they take advantage of our education system, right. our road network, our transportation, all the rest of it? This seems to some as unpatriotic. Uh, I'm sure the bean counters at these companies see it as a win-win. Uh, the, the smell. I, I'm not sure it passes the smell test for many, though. What's your view? So my view is, I, as you know, Bruce, I ran two public companies prior to running for Congress, two companies that I started. I would never move my company uh, internationally to lower taxes. I think it's a blessing to be in this country for the citizens, for our corporations, and they ought to pay their fair share. Having said that, we ought to recognize that we're in a global world and companies are competing globally. And in a free market economy, companies do make these decisions. 
And right now, the system is so bad, right? What happens is companies both keep their money overseas, and we get almost no tax on the revenues that they earn or the earnings that they produce overseas. And there have been so many solutions put forth to solve this problem that would change the incentives, prevent companies from making these decisions to domicile overseas, would create an environment where literally trillions of dollars could flow back to the United States. And importantly, it would raise revenues because we'd actually be taxing their overseas earnings. And corporate America is supportive of this solution too. So this is a problem that has some fairly obvious solutions. You just have to break from the ideological mode that we're in now in Congress to come up with them. Again, it's an area that I've worked on and built huge bipartisan support. It's, an, it's, a, it's a very, very significant missed opportunity in the country. The, but your question is, what would I do? I'd never locate my business internationally. The largest, I'd never do that. The largest gathering of world leaders ever just ended. It was in Paris, right. and the subject was uh, the climate crisis. Uh, President Obama, in his closing remarks, remarks expre expressed optimism that we can make progress on this. He said there's a huge global consensus on this. It may yeah. not, the consensus may not extend to the building and the body in which you serve. Uh, nonetheless, he thinks world leaders are prepared to act. Right, where are you on the optimistic, uh, pessimistic scale? So, so this is what I think. I think the climate situation is worse than we think it is. Right? The conventional wisdom around how bad climate is, I think it's worse. If you look at the data, the trends are, are worsening and they're more concerning. And the threat to American prosperity and global prosperity is huge. And I think the president is pitch perfect in the way he's described this problem. But I also think the technology, the innovation in the United States of America uh, against this problem is better than most people think it is. If you look at the progress we've made in solar, in wind, in conservation, in batteries, in all the things you need to change the energy mix in this country, the technology is doing really well. So what we ought to be doing, and Bill Gates actually has come out in the last couple of weeks and been very thoughtful on this topic, we need to do two things. Government should be pricing carbon. Right, so we start kind of changing the playing field mm -hmm. and stop all these subsidies that we have towards carbon-based energies and give non-carbon-based energies an opportunity to compete, which is why I've proposed legislation that does that. And then the second thing we need to do is dramatically increase our investments in R&D around green tech. The combination of those two things coming together in the, in the kind of innovative economy we have here in the United States of America, I think will create the environment where we can really radically change how we produce, distribute, and use energy in this country and actually make a difference against this. And this is what the president and his leadership is so important. A lot of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who, who don't acknowledge that this is a problem, which, which is ridiculous. Every, you know, every serious scientist has acknowledged this is a problem. Polls have come out recently have indicated that the, the majority of the American people, Democrats and Republicans, believe this is a problem. There are really smart free market solutions to this problem. The president's leadership, with his use at almost 200 countries, right, who are now focused mm -hmm. on this, I think this has been a real breakthrough moment for us. You and a small number of Democrats voted with Republicans in the House on the Syrian refugee bill. I'm yes. curious what the reaction has been from your constituents, and do you have any regrets for that vote? No, I, I don't have regrets. I mean, about a quarter of the Democrats vo voted for the bill. I think the reaction has been uh, interesting because I think of all the legislation that's come through the Congress, this piece of legislation in particular has not been well understood and has been described generally uh, by the media, uh, no disrespect intended, as something very different than what it was. What the bill simply did is require the administration to certify that the processes they have in place around ensuring that the refugees uh, that come into the country pose no risk of terrorism, that they actually certify that they're doing those, th those things. That's all the legislation did. It didn't limit the number of refugees. It didn't put up any specific barriers to preventing refugees from coming in. In fact, I've been on the record for a long time, as have many of my colleagues who also supported this legislation, saying we should increase the number of refugees we bring into the country. When you look at what the, the tragedy and the scale of the problem over there, my view, and I think many of my colleagues' view, has been if people really trust that the government is doing the screening to a high standard, that creates the environment for even allowing more refugees to come in. And this legislation simply put the administration in a position where they had to certify they're doing what they say they're doing. Based on what they say they're doing, they're, they're running a very thorough process. Right? And, and I support that. And I think what we voted for was to have them just put their name on the dotted line. I understand why they want to do it. No one likes to sign certificates. 
kind of saying, you know, confirming they're doing the processes. Why would anyone want to do that if they didn't have to? But if you really look at what that legislation did, that's all it did, is it simply said we, they have to certify that they're doing what they say they're doing. We have about a minute left. Under the leadership of uh, new speaker Paul Ryan, as you look ahead the next few weeks or months, are there any, do you have any concerns about uh, one issue or another issue uh, uh, um, being used to create some sort of uh, uh, government funding crisis. We have about 50 seconds left. Yes, I do. I mean, we have this, uh, these appropriations under this bill that we have to do. I'm very concerned that, that things like Planned Parenthood and other nonsense, and if you think about how destructive that rhetoric has been, particularly in the context of the recent tragedy in Colorado, I'm very concerned that some of those efforts will get put into this bill which, you know, I think is bad governing, bad policy. I mean, I could go on with all the problems with it. So we'll see if Speaker Ryan actually behaves differently than what we saw in some of these tactics in the past. I mean, if you do a, whether it's a debt ceiling bill or a government funding bill, it ought to be clean, it ought to focus on that issue, and it shouldn't be cluttered with other ornaments on the tree. Uh, they're unrelated to the core point of the bill. And that's what we've seen in the past, and I worry we might see that again. Congressman John Delaney, he's a Democrat from the 6th District of Maryland. He's with us today as part of our Connect to Congress series. Congressman, we appreciate your time as always. We thank you for being here, and we'll talk with you again, I'm sure. We'll take a break, come back with more News Talk.